of promoting a Parliament for Wales campaign. And one of the most ambitious rallies took place at Mechanchev, the town where Owen Lindu's old Parliament had met. 4,000 supporters attended, twice the expected number. But it was the composition of the crowd that was most surprising, not just the core supporters like teachers, academics, writers and ministers of religion. Now there were miners, quarrymen, railway workers. That day, Gwynfor ended with a barnstorming address which caused one newspaper reporter to say that it was Gwynfor, not an Irene Devon, who was the first finest orator in Wales. An Irene Devon was, um, you may remember, uh, he was a Labour member for uh, Edu Vale, and he was the designer of the National Health Service. The rally was chaired by Lady Megan Lloyd George and supported by Hugh T. Edwards, chair of the Council for Wales and Monmouthshire and of the Welsh Tourist Board, a man so many regarded as the unofficial Prime Minister of Wales. But the rally was, of course, organised by Plaid Cymru. On a personal note, I can tell you that these were thrilling days for teenage nationalists in the 1950s. Gwynfor was an inspiring figure for me, as indeed was Wynne Samuel, the Plaid candidate for my hometown, Aberdeer. The times were full of excitement for all young nationalists and times filled with lively discussions, indoor meetings, rallies and uh, the Clyde Summer Schools which uh, followed the Nationalised Stanford each year. We'd have the Summer School about three days, three or four days before the Nationalised Stanford and then uh, go on to the Air Stanford. So it was really a good time. I remember, as if it were yesterday, the rally at Pencader. On a very hot day in late September, thousands came to Pencader for the unveiling of an inscribed stone. It was erected there and commissioned by the Blyde. After a series of speeches, the stone was unveiled to reveal the prophecy made by the old man of Pencader to Henry II, 800 years before, when Henry asked him how long he thought the Welsh would keep fighting the English. <laughs> the old man's reply was this. This nation, O King, may now, as in former times, be harassed and in great measure weakened and destroyed by your and other powers. But it can never be totally subdued through the wrath of man, unless the wrath of God shall concur. Nor do I think that any other nation than this of Wales or any other language whatever hereafter may come to pass, shall in the day of severe examination before the Supreme Judge answer for this corner of the earth. <laughs> it must be said though that Clyde Cymru was in a ferment in Tholey in the 50s and 60s. The Parliament for Wales campaign was in tatters, no funds at all. The meetings of Clyde featured bitter arguments between the mainstream pacifists and those who wanted more militant action. I won't detail the wordy in fighting. It would be tedious. But I do mention a notable satirical play, Excelsior, written by Saunders Lewis, broadcast by the BBC on St. David's Day, 1962, 
which tried to pull the intellectual rug from under Gwynvor's feet. Between the two men, it was vendetta. But Gwynvor refrained from personal attacks on Saunders Lewis. Oh, Gwynvor was a very charming, polite, pacifist. <laughs> um, but he was also a great orator. The Plight candidates fought many parliamentary elections in the 50s and had many disappointments. I remember crying my eyes out in Aberdeer, on Victoria Square in Aberdeer when the Plight candidate, Win Samuel, lost his deposit. But then came the Carmarthen election of 1966, brought about by the death of Lady Megan Lloyd George, who held the seat for Labour. Her replacement by another representative, Labour representative was confidently expected, but the Plaid, though it had come in only third in the recent election, had increased its vote considerably. And as a result, Plaid felt encouraged. The timing was good. The election was held during college break, and hundreds of young nationalists flooded to Carmarthen to join the campaign. Youth branches locally were strong and hadn't been influenced by the infighting of recent years. Plight canvases were everywhere. Then came the result. Just before 1 a.m. in the town square, the crowd burst into singing, Hey and Willard will had I. There was movement at the windows of Guildhall. The clock came out on the balcony, on the balcony followed by the four candidates. <coughs> the historic announcement began. <clears throat> William Rhys Davis Labour, 13,474 votes. Howell Davis, Liberal, 8,650 votes. No one paid any attention to the conservative number. <laughs> <laughs> then the clerk pronounced the unforgettable Gwynfor Richard Evans. 16,000! The rest of the number was drowned in a roar <laughs> of joy. Oh. Gwynfor won the seat. He was the first nationalist to go to Westminster. Uh, represented, we had Welsh MPs, of course, but he was the first nationalist. And he won the seat again in 1974. How I would have loved to have been in Wales for those times, but by then I was a world away in Australia. There were many battles to be won or lost in the coming years. Always in the setting of pacifism versus militant aggression within Plaid circles. Mm. Both factions remained adamant in their opinions, leading to the formation of small groups like Kandaitha Sariais Kamrai, which is the Welsh language society. It was within the orbit of Plaid Cymru. They were all Plaid Cymru members. Um, and it has now, the uh, Welsh Language Society, grown into a really influential society in Wales with a large membership. And it is largely from this society that there are now Welsh medium schools where all subjects are taught through the medium of the Welsh language. And now also there is a, a Welsh medium university with different branches and colleges. There were recurring causes that required the full attention of Blyde, the Foreign Office at Westminster, from time to time would claim the thousands of acres of land for military training. The Forestry Commission promoted the awful march of the conifers, regarded by some as cultural imperialism 
of a most sinister kind, systematically eroding Welsh rural society. Gwynart, a poet from Ponte Dari, said, Forest is Sherby Fermin, a Kamatawashuk, and I cannot hear, and my fire met up Minotauros Sightsnake. Forest where there used to be farms, and in the darkness in the middle of it is the den of the English monster. <laughs> Certainly, these gloomy woodlands spreading everywhere over the bare hills fundamentally change the feel and character of Wales. If I were asked to choose an emotional subject relating to the Clyde in the 50s and 60s, I would choose the controversy surrounding the flooding of Avon Trewerin. Some of you are perhaps familiar with this. Liverpool is the big port city just beyond the border of Northern Wales. It needed to supplement its water supply. In 1956, the Liverpool City Council pulled a fast one. They bought a private bill before Parliament to develop a water reservoir by flooding the Trewellyn Valley in Merionshire, incidentally drowning the village of Capel Kellen. This bill, being private, would not require planning consent in Wales. The village was one of only four Welsh-only speaking communities. This is um, this is the village, Capel uh, Kellen, and it was what four four Welsh-only speaking communities, a pocket of Welsh culture. The executive members of Clyde Cumbly met at Aberystwyth, and it was decided to put up a fight. The link between Clyde Cymru and villagers in Capel Kellen was Elizabeth Watkin Jones in her role as secretary of the Tewerin Defence Committee. She and Gwynfor were the architects of this campaign. It was decided that constitutional non-militant action <coughs> should be employed first. 35 out of the 36 Welsh members of Parliament voted against this bill. But it was passed anyway. The villagers, helped by Plaid Cymru, waged an eight-year struggle to prevent the drowning. Gwynfor and Plaid organised an excursion of all the people of Capel Kellen by bus to Liverpool City Hall and time, timed for a critical council meeting, asking to be allowed to address the council. There they are. <coughs> Your homes are safe. Save ours. Do not drown our homes, they say. <coughs> and, um, but, well, by the, that the, it was presented at a critical time, you know, when the council was meeting. By then, the council chairman was already in the process of presenting the application to drown Capel Kellen. But they could hear the villagers singing from the street below in this council meeting. Unexpectedly, Gwynfor was allowed to address the full council, making a brilliant plea, as reported by the Manchester Guardian, but it was all to no avail. The valleys flooded in 1965. Families who had relation buried in the chapel cemetery were given the option of either moving them to another cemetery or leaving them. Eight bodies were disinterred, the others left. Uh, all the headstones <coughs> were removed and the cemetery covered in concrete the flooding of the valley, of these of the villagers leaving uh, 